Hello, I'm Jimmy Gallagher and welcome to this Scott Penn Annual Gathering Catch-Up. Today's conversation is looking at online engagement. We have three fantastic panellists, each of whom have very different perspectives on the online engagement world. First of all, we're going to have some introductions from our panel, so we're going to go straight over to Lewis. Hello, Lewis. Thanks very much. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lewis. I am a public engagement and community engagement consultant, and I um, run the Social Enterprise Science Cayley which is an intermediary organization that works across sectors, uh, supporting a Scotland that is creative, uh, curious, equitable, and health and well. And well. <laughs> I forgot our own tagline. Um, and for us, online engagement has been a real learning curve, but I think what we'll, I'll be talking about a little bit later is that I think it is a real opportunity as much as um, we still have to think about equity. And so I'll be sharing my three kind of key learnings about how online engagement can still support equitable kind of partnerships um, and through kind of blended approaches uh, can be add real impact to, to our work. Brilliant. Thank you, Lewis. So from Lewis, we're going to get that kind of the change that you're having to kind of deal with right away. You know, lots of community engagement, lots of in-person engagement and looking at how you're blending that. Fantastic. Um, so next, we're going to come to Sophia again, a, a really, really familiar uh, name to, to all of you in Scott Penn, a regular contributor to lots of discussions that are, are going on and from a, a different angle again. So, so Sophia, I, I feel that you are really at home with online engagement. That is kind of what you, um, uh, where you thrive, really. That's that your online engagement is your environment. Uh, so let's say hello to Sophia. If you could give us a bit of an introduction as to who you are and what you'll be telling us about today. Hello, Sophia. Okay, hello, hello, hi. Um, yeah, I would say that I am, uh, I've been doing online engagement for kind of 16 years or something. Um, I am a public engagement practitioner and consultant, and I most recently have been running a project called Parenting Science Gang, which mainly took place on Facebook. We're engaging um, communities, Facebook groups, um, with doing user-led citizen science. Um, but before that, uh, for years, I, I devised and ran a project called I'm a Scientist, get me out of here, which many of you may have heard of. In fact, half of you have probably taken part in, including I know Jamie did, um, everybody in public engagement in the whole of the country uh, is taking part in it. Um, so, you know, I'm very familiar with, with doing stuff online, but online is, is huge. You know, there's, there's so many different things one can be doing online. Everybody does things online every day. Um, Nobody can possibly know all about all of them. Do you know, people spend their whole lives becoming like a Twitter consultant or something, and, and they only know a fraction. So I, I have been doing it for 16 years, but I still kind of feel that, um, what's that word? Do you know when imposter syndrome, that's it. I feel like I don't really know anything. And then I just kind of realise that I do. Like the more I, I would if I hadn't been doing this. Um, but there's lots of advantages to online, um, and I think it's kind of brilliant in many ways. It's not perfect, but I'm going to talk to a great extent about the advantages when we get to mind it. So it's brilliant to be here. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Sophia. So uh, again, different perspective, someone that uh, is, is at home online that has been doing it. This isn't a lockdown thing for Sophia. This is, you know, Sophia's career. So thank you for that. Uh, next, we're going to go a little bit further away. So we're moving out of Scotland and getting a different voice, uh, not just a different voice from location wise, but also a different voice um, sector wise. So um, while uh, we're really, really familiar with university engagement, I did want to bring in a, a voice from the museum sector today, because for me, watching the way museums have uh, change their practice because of lockdown, the way they've really embraced uh, the online world has been really interesting for me um, because I have been critical of museums in the past and the kind of slow way that they can move. Uh, but when lockdown hit, wow, they really, really jumped online and really leading that charge uh, was Dan Vo. So next we're gonna to come to Dan. Again, a little bit of an introduction if you would, Dan, and then just share a little bit about what you'll be talking about today. Hello, Dan. Hello, I don't know about leading the charge, but hello, I'm Dan Vo, and you may have seen me on Museum From Home, and also I'm currently the project manager for the Queer Heritage and Collections Network, which is a partnership formed of the English um, National Trust, English Heritage, Historic England, Historic Royal Palaces, and the uh, University of Leicester's Research Centre for Museums and Galleries. So a lot of that is going to be looking at how, going forward, we as a whole sector will be looking at creating queer history 
content for online mostly at the moment because um, originally what was going to be a lot of face-to-face -face research and sharing is now strictly online so that's uh, that's that's an interesting sort of viewpoint for me because a lot of everything that we're doing is shifting a lot of those fusty dusty collections are suddenly very quickly um, very, being very very clever about what we do online so uh, I want to talk a little bit with you all today about that idea of co-curation which is at the very core of what I do as a museum freelancer it's about audience engagement and it's also about interpretation and it's about bringing in the lived experience of say your volunteers or say your staff or whoever you bring in the community that you bring in so I think that co-curation will be uh, an interesting point to look at because it is about providing as Jamie was saying, voices it is about providing providing as many voices into the one uh, sort of object telling or the storytelling. But it's also about asking uh, whose voice are you centering in that storytelling? Who is going to be the the who's going to be the focus of that particular story? So that's some of the things that I'd like to talk about with you today. So we're going to come back to, to Lewis, um, first of all. Uh, so Lewis, if, if you could tell us a little bit more then about um, how you've managed to create that kind of blended online in-person, how you've shifted and tried to carry on that engagement uh, that you're so used to doing in person. So Lewis, back over to you. Thanks very much. Yes, I mean, I'm a massive advocate for face-to-face -face and I, I still think I am, but I think like everyone else and, and lots of other sectors, as already mentioned, um, the shift online has opened up new possibilities. I think we've all been learning. And I think you can still do amazing, actual kind of community-based work with that. Absolutely. And I think um, we've learned a lot in terms of that. So I've got three, I guess, key points and maybe a couple of examples that we can share as well. Um, so the first one, I think, is one that we all know, but it's sometimes easy to forget. But equity, accessibility, and inclusion are still as important online as they are as in person. Um, Arguably, I think I've got a poll question coming up, which is just a reflective question uh, for the members. Uh, but I think the question of within public engagement of on community engagement, who we're working with and what it's for and who's not in the room, either digitally or not, are more important than ever, actually. And I think with online, that's even more the case because you, you really are just you've got um, you're shouting out into this digital void sometimes. Um, and so I think that really determines how we think about the medium, how we think about the format uh, that works best for the dem demographics of all that we want to be engaging with. Uh, and obviously that's, you know, it's the time of Black Lives Matter, so thinking about race, thinking about gender, all the intersections with disability, but obviously with these new uh, focus, quite rightly, on digital exclusion um, and health inequalities as well. Um, there's some simple things we've picked up from, and I think it is easier than ever to make things more accessible. So things like using PowerPoint on a Zoom, um, we'll have auto captions, which aren't perfect, but can be helpful. Uh, there's lots of transcribing options that you can use. Uh, things like Otter AI are great, so you can offer that. Obviously, ideally, things like BSL in the long term. And, it's, and obviously, there's a practical and, and sometimes a financial restraint to that. But it's always important to have that kind of open conversations and look at multiple formats so then people can engage in different ways and catch up later as well. Um, and certainly what's been really interesting is working with groups like the Glasgow Disability Alliance is that it's, it's important to stress, and I think Sophia will talk about this as well, is it's actually online is absolutely more inclusive for many, many groups as well. And we shouldn't forget that. And I think it's interesting that, you know, a lot of the things that have happened disabled people have been asking for for a long time and haven't happened until non-disabled people have needed it. But it is more flexible uh, for people who are working with family commitments, uh, people who are shielding, obviously let's not neglect them, uh, geographical spreads. And there's also a sense of, from, certainly from the arts world, uh, a lot more people trying something new because they don't have to even be go to a room. So the, the barrier is a little bit, and it's a little bit more anonymous perhaps, so people feel a wee bit safer. Um, I guess to achieve this online, the second point I want to make is partnerships are always going to be key. And I think, again, especially so with online as well. I think that's how you can start blending that offline online kind of relationships to work in targeted ways. Uh, so these are the intermediaries out in communities, third sector, who've done the work of building relationships with specific groups that can be quite difficult to do online if you're completely new. And if you know, uh, if you work with these groups, you can work in that more targeted way online. But I think what's important there is it opens up the question of needing to work on their terms um, and learning from their experience. And I think that's open the question for public engagement in terms of what are we actually always offering? Is it always just specific with research or is it actually the broader assets that the research community have, whether that's digital skills, 
volunteering capacities, things like that as well in our communities. And there are a lot of pressures. So I have, I think there's a second poll question as well that I'll be interested to hear in terms of what Scott Penn's experience of working with partners are um, and to see what that happens. And you can take as many as, as, as you would like. I think it should be multiple choice. Um, and with partnerships, I think blended models work really well. So that's mixing kind of very often packages. I know a lot of members have been doing that with working online as well. And that's worked really well for some of our projects with engaging libraries. That's makes it working with the mobile libraries to actually physically give people postcards to engage with research with UHI as well as online. For example, that's, and these, you know, mobile libraries going house to house, uh, very rurally. Oh, there we go. Thanks very much, Amy. Um, People know how our curiosity project with youth workers, that's all shifted online as well to transitions. Um, so that's been really interesting mixing that with packages, for example, uh, and with fun palaces, which is across arts and culture as well. We've been focusing very much on tiny revolutions of connection. Um, and so this is the idea of how we can build small activities that build connections socially. And a lot of that has been focused on things that are easily accessible offline, uh, those who are shielding, those who are more vulnerable to be led by. So things like everything's on PDFs that are easily printable and sendable as well in, in care packages. So I'll, I'll, I'll share a link to that a little bit later. The last point I want to really quickly make, uh, so online doesn't always have to be about knowledge transfer in the traditional sense. So it's not just about informing, but actually one of the biggest projects that we've been working on over lockdown has been building a community of practice with community intermediaries. And the idea behind that, and that's with the Scottish Libraries and Information Council, is that if we can support libraries, uh, community workers, third sector groups, grassroots community people across Scotland to be more confident about learning from each other around STEM, around well-being, um, around research, around culture and creativity, then they can then support their own communities to do that more locally as well. And so uh, with the Culture and Wellbeing Community Group, we've been running that as a Facebook group as well. We've got modules and units and been facilitating conversations. Um, and it's less train the trainers and more connect the connectors. And um, in a world online, which is all about, there's so much content out there. I think it's more about being able to build these connections and build that resilience. And so we can look at things like specifically anti-racism. We had a conversation about that and decolonizing with our new partners, anti-racist educator, digital inclusion, um, for example, um, and then also bringing researchers in. So we're making researchers accessible to communities rather than the other way around, signposting to resources, sharing experiences within that community of practice, and then also think about how you can work offline. And by supporting these connectors, they can then transfer those skills and that knowledge and that, that hopefully uh, in the communities, both offline and the, with the more kind of um, diverse communities that they serve. So I'll stop there, but uh, it'll be interesting to see the polls and any questions I, I very much invite. Brilliant. Uh, brilliant. Thank you for that, uh, Lewis. A couple of comments in the, the chat box there. Um, uh, if you want to just have a glance, see if there's anything in the chat box you want to respond to. But I, I do have one question uh, that came to mind when you were talking, Lewis. Um, was, I, I associate with you working with kind of communities of place very often. So, so, you mm -hmm. know, you have a very kind of localized area where this is where you're trying to have your intervention. And I was wondering, is it difficult working with geographically placed communities opposed to other kind of communities um, because you're online? Is that particularly challenging for you or have you found ways around that? Yeah, I think with that, it's, it's very specifically with partnerships, I think. So, for example, with our Engaging Libraries project, that's a partnership with UHI and the Western Isles Libraries in particular. So I think through that partnership, we can really get a sense of, you know, we're, we're employing local artists and I think that's really important. So we're, we're, we're supporting kind of local talent and, and long term skills. Um, even what, even though we are online and actually, if, if anything, it's opened up obviously new possibilities because, you know, certainly for us, for our project, uh, projects, we are getting much better geographical reach. And I, with my, certainly my Fun Palace Scotland ambassador role, that's always been relatively national. But with the partnerships like the um, Scottish Libraries Information Council, for example, uh, um, we can actually reach via these community spaces that are libraries, um, actually quite a broad reach. So in our network, for example, I think we were represented 70, 75% of the local authorities in terms of community um, partners and libraries in the group itself. So this is our way of being able to support 
locally, people locally, even though we're using kind of a, a blended online model. Brilliant. Um, Thank you, Lewis. Um, do you want so me to answer one of the, any of the? Well, maybe if you just um, touch on on platforms as well, because there's a lot of kind of Teams, Zoom, accessibility. Have you found that mm -hmm. one platform is more accessible than others? Yeah, there's no uh, one size that fits everyone for sure. Uh, and that, that so I, I very much sympathize with a lot of these um, discussions. So for our community group, for example, we ask people to tick which ones, uh, which, which, which ones uh, formats that the council has blocked or they're not allowed to use. Um, so in general, I find Zoom to be the most um, catch all, the most useful. Um, and alongside having things like if we put a PowerPoint on it, it can do auto captions, things like that can be really helpful. Um, but again, it's, it's about working with the, the groups because obviously if the partners that you work with are part of a council that don't allow Zoom, then obviously trying to find other alternatives, um, it, you just have to work with that as well. Um, but definitely, yeah, we've used all the platforms. We, ask, we just tend to ask, but then we also acknowledge that we can't help, you know, uh, this, a workshop this afternoon, for example, not everyone can use Zoom. So we just have to go with, you know, the most common and acknowledge that actually we just have to set up another option for people who can't ac access in that way. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Lewis. Uh, so just just on, on platforms as well, I know that um, I've worked with lots and lots of different universities. I've been doing lots of training online and some universities, uh, like Barry mentioned, you know, you're, you're pushed towards team because they're not wanting to use Zoom. I've noticed a little bit of a rollback. Zoom did have some problems and they fixed them. And some universities are now dialing back because I, I think, uh, although you know, we're saying that there isn't one platform better than the others, in terms of external engagement, Teams is a disaster. Teams is great for uh, inter-organizational meetings and things like that, but to run a workshop, to run an external event on Teams, oh, it's awful. Um, anyway. I was going to say that's just my opinion, but it's not. That's just a fact. Uh, next, we're going to come to uh, Sophia. Uh, Lindsay, maybe, maybe if, uh, if, if Lewis can maybe type a response to the uh, auto captions on Zoom, which there's two ways of doing it, um, or anyone else. If not, I'll, I'll respond to that um, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, but now we're going to come over to Sophia again. Uh, just bring up your camera. Uh, so, Sophia, you're not dealing with a radical shift to, to online. You're taking the kind of planned approach. You're kind of like, what's all this fuss about? I've been doing it for years. Tell us a little bit about that, Sophia. Um, hi. Well, I mean, obviously, like everyone else, you know, I'm, I'm living through a global pandemic and my life has had to move online more than it did before, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was used to running stuff online, doing stuff online, and I was. You know, I was working from home anyway, and, and in fact, my child is home educated anyway. So the first few weeks of this lockdown, I was a little bit, what's all the fuss up, everybody? This is just normal. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I've, been, I've been doing online stuff for a long time. And I think that, well, firstly, I want to talk about, I think there are some real, there are access problems. There are people who doing stuff online exclude. And, you know, the, the, we, we can't kind of pretend that's not the case. And if you're doing the kind of project when you are trying to serve the whole of a community, you need to think about that and you need to find some way of reaching the members of that community who aren't going to be online. Um, but for a lot of groups, online is like a lot more accessible. So, for example, you know, in Parenting Science Gang, we had people taking part from Shetland and from Orkney who could never have, have come to a, an in-person event. So, you know, most, I mean, if, if you're the Royal Institution or something, you know, most of the events that you're going to run are in London. So, if people live within striking distance of London, they can come to them. And if people come live in like the whole of the rest of the country, they can't. Um, uh, so people who are rural, people who are in far flung parts of the country can, can do stuff online just as easily as, as anybody else can. Um, uh, people who are housebound or have mobility issues can do stuff online much more easily. Um, people who are parents of, some, of young children can do stuff online. So the, Parenting Science Scan, we were particularly engaging with parents of young children. And, you know, when my child was young, I could never go to events outside of the house, unless those events were entirely child focused and they had a bouncy castle and, and stuff. You know, it was very, very difficult for me to go to something outside of the house. Definitely something in the evening. You know, you'd have to get a babysitter, and that's really difficult with a small child. And, you, you only want, you know, you want to save that for like special occasions. You don't want to use that up on kind of, you know, some kind of public engagement event, you know, or talk about science. 
Um, whereas people can do stuff, you know, my, my child can be asleep in bed or, or you know, um, watching a little bit of cartoons in the evening or something, and I can be doing stuff online. Um, you know, I don't have to go anywhere, it's much easier. Um, and online is also fantastic for non-geographic communities. So if you've got, if you're trying to do something with a community that is not geographic, but is spread out across the country, it's very difficult to get them together for an in-person event, unless you've got kind of massive amounts of funding or everyone's super committed to coming to your event. But you can do stuff online with those groups. You know, if, you, if you're doing something with, let's say people who have a rare disease or something, and you know, there's only one in 10,000 people or something have it, it's very difficult to do something geographically with those people. But they've probably all got a kind of support group online that, you know, that, that's where you can easily find them all together. Or if people are sort of, you're trying to engage vets and, you know, every small town in the country has got one vet and they never get to talk to other vets and share practice, but you can do something online and they can all get together without them all having to kind of take days and days out of their life and travel to London or whatever. Um, so I think online is brilliant in lots of ways. In all these ways um, it we also some other advantages um, it's a lot less fuss in some ways to organize as, as an event organizer because you don't have to you don't have to worry about people's allergies and providing food you don't have to like worry about whether there's enough toilets or seating or venue acoustics or what the parking is like or letting people know about you know how to get there on the bus loads of things that when you try when you're trying to organize an in-person event you have to spend weeks organizing but if you're doing something online you don't have to worry about any of those things you know people have sorted this the comfortable seating and the toilet and stuff out from bus because they were at home um so you can just focus on the actual engagement activity itself um which in in many ways makes it much easier and that also means that people are these people are at home they're, they're they're comfortable usually hopefully um so they, uh, it's easier in some, in a lot of ways, to engage people because they're 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 guards down. They're at home. They feel comfortable. They're not. For a lot of people, it's intimidating to walk into a room full of strangers. It's intimidating to kind of speak in in public. It, it can be intimidating just to kind of open the door. And you know, pe some people will. And even you know, I'm I'm a fairly gregarious kind of person, but I've I've felt intimidated by events and and, and turn around and and away sometimes and shyer people than me presumably do it more you know or don't even get on the bus to go to it you know online there's a different sort of dynamic and, and it's quite easy to, to type something it's easier to type something often than it is to speak it out loud particularly in front of people you don't know um when i was running i'm a scientist we would get uh, teachers contact us and say well that was really amazing because you know the child in the class who never speaks in class is really shy but um but he, he's one of his hobbies is like gaming and he's used to sort of chatting on online, that online environment. So as soon as that was the environment we were providing in, in science class, that child really blossomed and, and he sort of knew what to do and he's typing away and all the other kids were like deferring to him because he kind of seemed to know what he was doing there. And it really changed the whole classroom dynamic and allowed that child to sort of shine. Um, and, you know, these, these are the kind of things that, that online can, the ways that online can change uh, dynamics and, and people's experiences. Um, but one thing, um, oh, and sorry, one um, uh, and, and other advantages. So what you can't have is quite the immediacy usually that you can from like a kind of one day workshop can be quite an intense experience for people. They're, they're, they're all there together um, and it, it can feel very, ooh, um, online is often a little bit muted by comparison. It's not such, it's not so immersive. Um, but what you can have is a sort of dip in and out um longer term relationship um more easily so you know with parenting science camp people were in our facebook group and they were they were taking part over two years and they sort of dipped in and out and there were people who were busy who were more active in some parts of the project than others because they had a second baby or they went back to work or whatever, so they've had less free time but they could dip in and out and, and if they've got five minutes they could just sort of go on the group and, and like scroll for five minutes if they've got longer they could do it for longer and they could engage more but you weren't sort of like, like, right, you've got a free Saturday for us to come and take part in this event, you know, which often can for a lot of people is difficult to provide that kind of time in a big chunk. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there are these fantastic uh, advantages to doing stuff online. Um, 
but I would I urge you if you're trying to do take an activity that you already had and transfer it into online. This very important quote: "You don't make a film by filming a play from the best seat in the house." And what I mean by that is. Think about the things that you can do online. Think about all of the possibilities. You can kind of click on things. You can you can have polls. You can have threads. You can embed videos. All sorts of things. And um, don't try and make. Don't try and think. But this is how we would do it if it was offline. Let's try and do that as close to that exactly as possible online because that's not how it works. I mean, once once lockdown happened, my local pub. I live in a, a small town in the Scottish border. The the pub there is like the interchange for all information normally obviously once lockdown happened the pub was not an interchange of information that function was then taken up by the community facebook group now the community facebook group doesn't have pretend tables or a pretend bar or any of the things that the pub has it wasn't trying to imitate the pub in any way but it was performing the same function as the pub so this is what i mean by this if, if you take away one thing from, from my talk, please let it be there. Um, online can be completely different. It doesn't all have to be Zoom meetings, lovely as Zoom meetings are and fun, and we get to see other people's human beings' faces. So, um, two last things I want to say. Uh, I, this, is, this is my low tech way of like not having to have slides. And, right, can you read the bit at the top? This is like how many clicks, basically. Everybody's clicks are on Facebook. Most people's clicks most of the time are on Facebook. Um, so Facebook are evil, um, but uh, they are very good at mass online communications. And most people have a, most online adults have a Facebook account and spend time on Facebook every week, if not every day. And um, most people's the majority of people's online clicks, uh, more of them are on Facebook than are on anywhere else. So. Uh, even though it's evil, do consider Facebook as a place to do stuff because that's where a lot of your people that you want to engage are going to be already spending their time and they're comfortable there and they know what they're doing and they can chat to their friends as well. And you know, it's easy, it's well, it's well put together, it's like being evil. Um, and the other last thing I want to say almost everyone is on a smartphone, so please do not assume. I mean, obviously, in our work hours doing like quirky stuff, maybe we're going to sit in front of a laptop or a desktop computer. But most people, normal people, in the evenings or whatever, are not going to be sat in front of the computer. They're going to be on their phone, sitting on the sofa while kind of half watching telly or something. So make sure whatever you're doing is, is kind of compliant to being used on the phone. Okay, and that is, have I gone over my time massively? Um, I should actually look at the time when I started, sorry. There we go. Thank you. Oh, there's no timers here. We're all friends. Um, <laughs> Thank you for that, Sophia. Uh, another interesting um, stat as well, talking about, you know, we, 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 we do talk about the people that we're excluding from the online space a lot. Um, but, um, the, you know, as you said, the vast majority of people do have access to the internet. And the majority of people who don't have access to the internet don't want access to the internet. So uh, there was a, a survey done um, at the start of 2019 that showed, I think it was like six in 10 people who don't have access to the internet don't have it because they don't want it. Um, but a great opportunity to reach uh, other communities uh, instead. Uh, there was a question, uh, I just lost it, from, from Vary. So, Sophia, I wonder if you could just touch on for a second. Um, does online engagement promote a slower pace of engagement? Um, so, uh, from Vary there. So, Sophia, do you think that online engagement is a slower process? I, uh, I don't know. I think online engagement is, covers so many different things. You know, I mean, I mean, this what we're doing right now is, is online engagement, isn't it? Um, and I don't think this is necessarily slower, but I do think that do, doing the kind of thing we did with Parenting Science Gang on, on Facebook, I think that for me that was easy to do, yes, kind of slowly. And it's, you can't, if you've got everybody in a room, so for example, we had stages in the process where we'd be like, right, um, uh, you know, throw out all the parenting questions that you have and then a process of like narrowing it down um if you were doing something and, and then kind of taking them and, and uh, trying to turn them into a kind of idea for a, a, an experiment and um, now if you were doing that in person you have people at tables you'd be like right do this task we're going to go away and in half an hour we're going to come back to your table and we're going to go right what have you come up with and everyone will obviously have to admit because you know you don't want you don't want to be embarrassed that the 
the presenter with their microphone comes back to the table and goes, right, <laughs> what have you just come up with? Whereas you ask people those kind of questions online, people are like, oh, this seems a bit difficult. I don't really know. I don't know how you would do this. And they're sort of thinking and they're thinking and they're like, oh, look, my sister-in-law just put her holiday photos. I'll have to click on that and I'll go away and I'll forget to come back. You know, it's, you don't have people trapped <laughs> when you're doing stuff online. <laughs> and so you have to allow a lot more time for a lot of parts of the process. Yeah. But you can do things with a kind of immediacy like this. And we, I mean, we would do, we did very little using video. And we never did anything with video in time scientists. But we did do chat rooms and be like, right, this is an appointment. You're going to come at this time to the chat room. And, and if you, um, you know, if you, if you sort of trail it enough and remind everybody. So if you do get quite a lot of people at that, and, and you know, that's an hour that's dedicated and people sort of do stuff in that time. Have I answered the question or have I just waffled? No, no, I, I think you did. If not, I'm sure um, Barry will, will follow yeah, up with but more I'm questions. I'm sure Barry will feel happy to. If, happy to if need be. Um, brilliant. Thank you, Sophia. So, uh, again, keep the, the, the thoughts, comments, questions uh, coming in the chat box um, as, as we go through. We're going to come to our third speaker now. Um, uh, and again, I, I think museum engagement online particularly interesting because, and this is maybe my outside perspective, um, museums very, very often focus around object-based learning and object-based activities. It's about collections. All of a sudden, the gates are closed, the objects, the collections are not accessible. Uh, so what do you do when you're a museum? How do you promote effective engagement while the doors are closed? Dan, over to you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to do a bit of Blue Peter thingy thing now, which is I, I just brought this out while we were talking. So this is sort of did. This is Museum from Home. This is all the fabulous people that we had a chat with, well, we being we be me. Um, and I wanted to kind of give you a bit of an idea of what was happening with all that. So there's about, there's more than 80 people there. Because when lockdown started, uh, on day one of lockdown for me, I opened up my smartphone and I just opened up a live feed on Twitter and I started just monologuing and it was awful. But very quickly I learned that, uh, yeah, my monologues are awful, but if I had chats with people, uh, I can actually start to keep that idea of the museum open and alive. And also all the people that I spoke with are people who are dedicated to principles that I believe in, which is diversity, inclusion, equality, and they all do amazing things. So all the people that you see here, they represent all different parts of the museum. And so it was about making it interesting to uh, the the average goer to the museum. So we weren't being uh, very specialist in what we do. We talked about very specialist topics, but it was always about making it accessible to them. And so I think somebody was saying earlier, you know, they were very excited about the idea of making the, um, the, the academic accessible to the public. That's very much what we were trying to achieve here as well. And a lot of that comes down to some very basic principles that I've kind of uh, picked up over the years. So a lot of it is to do with co-curation. I do lots of co-curation. So it starts with the object, but the object is just a bounce point to get to either the maker uh, a person or the subject, again, a person or the community. It's something that the community has come in and applied their own story to this piece. So I specifically do LGBTQ plus history and heritage. And that has always involved working with volunteers to tell stories about objects, but also to apply their own stories to it as well. What do they see? And by effect, what does the visitor see when they come to the collection as well? So what you, the visitor, see when you come to the collection is as important as what a curator has spent an entire career studying as well. And we place those two interpretations side by side and hold them in equal weight. What you see and what a curator can apply to the object is also equally important to, uh, to, to anybody coming on the V&A LGBTQ tour, but we also do them in, uh, in Cambridge and also Cardiff. I think what might be interesting for yourselves is to talk about uh, some of the ones that I do in the Scott Polar, the Zoology Museum, and also the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, because we're talking about natural history in a way, but we're still able to queer it as well. And it was about how we found the stories and how we centered the voices within the stories as well. So I, for me, um, knowing your audience is really important. And part of this is going to come down to a few lessons that have been learned from um, just right. Uh, museum labels because I think that's a really good exercise in terms of you are taking somebody's entire life study and distilling it into 80 words which is 
tweetable. Um, it's close to a tweet. I think a tweet's about, you could probably get about 40 or 50 words in. So it's even more distilling. But uh, at the VNA, we have this sort of gold standard where we apply uh, 10 rules. And the 10th rule is to think of George Orwell. And it's to distill, distill, distill. And it really is to, uh, when this happens, it means that your engagement is suddenly, uh, you are being non-specialist because uh, on one hand, you want to convey as much information as po possible, so it is intensely rich. It, um, it's like an OXO cube, um, but at the same time, it's also uh, usable by anyone. So knowing your audience is incredibly important. And for me, uh, I'm handling the social media accounts for a few organizations. That audience will change from tweet to tweet. And that question about whether using online is faster or slower, we take that into account as well. So on one hand, you are really trying to appeal to somebody while they're just scrolling through, while they're also perhaps watching you know, a bit of Star Trek on the side and just got their phone up. Um, but we're also uh, thinking about the person who will be intensely reading through every single word that we write uh, over the next months and may come back to the point three months later and go, did you really mean this? And so when we write, we kind of try and future-proof our tweets as well. Uh, we always write as we speak, and so uh, a lot of that inaccessibility is broken down by not using sort of um, technical terms, or specialist terms. Uh, if we do use it, we usually immediately explain what it means afterwards. And I think this is a, a really strong principle of uh, museum labels that have changed. You probably would have seen this change over the last five years. Uh, I think lots of museums are now recognizing that our audience, for example, um, are not necessarily English first speaking. I'm personally not English first speaking. Um, English is not my first language. Um, but also, uh, they want to be able to access the, the object straight away without having to know the technical terms for how a chair is crafted, for example. Um, uh, so um, keeping it short and snappy, that's just mandatory because that's what we're allowed to do with Twitter. I'm Twitter native, and a lot of the teams that I work with, they obviously have different strengths. Uh, others are Instagram natives, that's very visual. Others are Facebook, so you can write a lot more. Uh, and then there's ones that are TikTok based as well. And, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a new, younger um, creator. Um, but it's thinking about the same, piece of, um, the same piece of information and how do you retranslate that for all different uh, audiences. I mean, I'm Twitter native, and I think that it works for me because I've spent 16 years as a radio producer. And so that idea, again, of, you know, distilling all this information into half an hour or an hour segment, I think, um, has been really helpful. And that's about organizing the information as well. So always uh, knowing what the key highlight of your story is, and then really just dropping them in straight away. So hooking them right from the start, but then slowly drip feeding the additional information that gives it a more holistic or rounded story. So applying that background, sketching in the background for them. Um, and I think that makes it a lot more engaging. So it's not just about the object, it's about the people that are involved in that object. Because every single object in a museum was potentially stolen, uh, given, uh, it was given to someone, it was loved, it was cherished, it was hated. Um, and that story, that person, um, that, that, that brings in that element of the story, I think is the most important thing. Um, I've got Sebastian here with me. Sebastian sort of sits near me because Sebastian becomes my uh, audience surrogate. Um, back when I was doing radio, it wasn't Sebastian the otter, it was a little lamb that was a you. And so when you talk, you always go to you, you know, you turn to you and you speak to the person listening uh, and, and reading through. Uh, and having that conversation with them as well, the really important thing is also um, acknowledging that, you know, we are on equal terms and sometimes I may not know everything. And so what you may know is also equally important. And so opening up the sphere so that you can say, and if you know more, if you want to contribute to this as well, um, please do. And I think that that's what is really interesting for, say, uh, the, I'll give just two um, tweet examples um, that <clears throat> I found really interesting just over the last couple of days, which is today we talked about Sorry, I should have had a glass of water, but it's over there. So um, today we talked about the uh, Gross Indecency Act uh, that was supposed to make uh, gross indecency between women illegal. Um, so it passed through the House of Commons, but it was blocked at the House of Lords. But um, in terms of centering the voice, there was no way we were going to use the voices of 
the House of Lords or the House of Commons. We picked a woman to tell the story. And so we looked at it from her perspective and how she responded to, to it and how her challenge to the House of Lords ultimately led to it being blocked. I think her question was quite simple, you know, what, what acts does this gross indecency uh, include? And, and, you know, asking the House of Lords to explain exactly what acts will, um, will, will it would involve, I think, shut it down very quickly. You know, I think the, the blushes of the House of Lords, I think is a very funny image that, that is my health, uh, my mind. But the other thing that we did yesterday was we talked about Roger Casement, which is a very complex, um, story because uh, ultimately he was hanged for treason. Um, he was, uh, he believed in um, independence of Ireland. Uh, he was originally part of the colonial mechanism of, of Britain, uh, the British Empire, but he changed his mind partway through and wrote some really interesting reports about humanitarianism. Uh, and he had relationships with men while he was out in, um, um, oh gosh, um, the Congo. So Again, it's about how we centered that story. And ultimately, I created it as a way to just open up and let multiple voices come in. And so we had experts that came from a decolonial ex uh, expertise explaining the story in that perspective. I had another expert who uh, looked at the relationships and the power dynamics between him and the black men that he was with and, you know, looking at it from that perspective. Uh, and there was another who was just looking at it from the, the local British perspective as to, you know, what that meant for uh, talking about discussions of homosexuality in the public uh, and, and what that meant to the press at the time. So it was trying to just bend in as many of these uh, expert voices as possible, making it completely accessible, of course, but it was acknowledging that when you talk about people's lives, they're incredibly complicated. And if you are thinking about that idea of here's the instant engagement and then there's the three months down the line engagement, it was future proofing it to sort of say that he's a complicated character. There are things about him that aren't great about his biography. There are great things that we want to celebrate, but there are things that, uh, you know, we also need to acknowledge that he was pretty bad at as well. So that was a way that we looked at it uh, and, and ensured that, you know, we can't get an entire essay about his life via Twitter. But we can bring in a, a few, you know, pithy points about his life and then allow those academics to kind of create their own threads as well. So pulling it into one point and then uh, decentralizing the discussion as well, which I hope uh, sort of works as a way of uh, the core practice really of, you know, bringing in multiple voices to, to share a narrative. And then in that perspective, their own perspective, there are so many different ways of engaging. So that's... That's a little bit of a taster for what I think of when I approach uh, taking an academic and making them accessible. Here in the case of Museum From Home, we had 15 minutes for them. Um, I think for most people who did Museum From Home, it was using a minute to tell the story of an object. But for me, it was spending 15 minutes with an academic or a curator or a person who worked front of house, back of house, all the different functions of the museum. 15 minutes with them to distill everything that they know about their their whole career trajectory, all the things that they've learned, and then putting out into a 15-minute story. And really that's about finding all those hooks and uh, making you interested in their story. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Dan. Um, I, I, I do have one question um, for you. Uh, but first, I'll just say, Dan mentioned Star Trek, and Aaron, like, let out a Star Trek squee as well. I have to mention, um, every, every um, night at seven o'clock, uh, Dan and a group of us all live watch an, uh, an episode of Star Trek Voyager. Dan's never seen Star Trek Voyager before. Every night at lockdown at seven o'clock, we all watch. And we started live tweeting, but then we realized all our followers must hate the live tweets at seven. So we moved on to WhatsApp. Um, but online has created a whole new world where you can just watch TV with people. And uh, so, yeah, we're midway through the Delta, Delta Quadrant uh, on our jolly way home. Um, but anyway, there was a question, which actually, I, I say I have a question. It was Vi's question. We both have the same question, which means it's an important one. How are all this online engagement, um, how are you trying to make it a, a dialogue? So I think it could so easily be, here is the object, here is the information but you've mentioned a lot of ways in which you've tried to humanize it. So are there any ways that you've found that are particularly good for taking it from dissemination to engagement to get kind of the, the voices coming back with you? It comes back to this lovely fellow here. So Sebastianus is my anchor. Um, so it reminds me that I always center the audience at the core of everything that we do. So if we're having a chat uh, on Museum From Home, we're still doing it to a particular audience. And it, it specifically is also the way that I set up the chat as well. It's a bit bizarre because it's uh, me staring at a computer screen and the person, the guest, is on that computer screen. But it reminds me that I always look to the phone, out to the phone, and I look to the phone to interpret the, the guest 
through that that camera lens. And so for me, it's a constant reminder that he sits on top of the uh, the the iPhone, and so I always speak to the audience. And I think that that is the most important fundamental way. And you know, I was taught this by um, my media uh, trainer back you know 20 years ago, um, and we it was really stupid. All the, all the trainee presenters would bring like a stuffed toy <laughs> to sit on top of the microphone. Um, it looked ridiculous, but it really reminded us that we're ultimately always talking to an audience. And so that's the the most important thing and the easiest thing to remember that if you're always saying you 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 that's um that's going to make sure that you break through that barrier um and i i think that that for me is what helps the most um i've also got to say uh, i always sneak in a bit of coded messaging uh, occasionally as well just because of the way that i interpret queer history it's all about the code messages so jamie this one's uh, this this has been floating about just for you as well so all those star trek fans in the audience now you get this one <laughs> you never saw this it doesn't exist <laughs> Which, of course, um, a fundraiser. Oh, sorry, I cut you off. Cut you off. Sorry, Dan. It's a it's a fundraiser that Jamie does for the Albert Kennedy Trust as well. So this is um, also done with a lot of love. Ah, thank you. Yeah, my little rainbow badges. Um, thank you. That that has uh, brought us to the end of today's session. So thank you to Sophia, Louis, Lewis, and uh, Dan for those insights. Thank you to everyone that's left lots of comments in the chats and, and questions. I, I did want to leave one uh, little link in the chat box. Uh, a couple of things I've been working on uh, lately. I curated a, a list of 65 different online engagement projects um, and put them on a Padlet if people are interested in them. So if you want to see some examples of online engagement that is happening, uh, click through there. The second link is um, a guide to running online meetings, uh, which I kind of crowdsourced during some of my training uh, workshops. So a couple of links there to explore afterwards. Copy and paste them or click them just now because it is time to say goodbye to you all. Uh, thank you again to my speakers. Thank you to everyone that has joined in. Make sure you know exactly where you're going for your next call. Pen event which is happening on Monday if you've got a ticket for that if not join the waiting list and come back and see me on the 24th of August when we'll be looking at international engagement with our international panel so thank you very much for joining us and I will see you all again soon bye bye